in John's Gospel as well. And he asked him in a manner of speaking, when will the last day be? When will the coming day of judgment? Jesus said, the angels don't know. The Son doesn't know. The only one who knows is my Father in heaven. If all three are one, how could the Father know and the Son not know? I'll give a quotation by a particular writer called Charles Cameron. And he states that the attribution of divinity to Jesus has had serious consequences. And I'm not saying many Christians, of course, are sincere, but I'm talking about the imperialistic form of Christianity, as you find the imperialistic form of Islam, the extremes of two different faiths, where people take their religion to the extremes, polarize each other. But he says that the logic of the position has yielded a double-edged sword. If Jesus is God, then God allows himself to be edged out of the world and onto the cross. <clears throat> Thus, God is weak and totally powerless in this world. He helps us, not through his omnipotence, but through his weakness and suffering. This has led Christian missionaries to impose a submissive love <coughs> on the members of non-Western cultures they converted. Thus, paving the way for their colonization or for sustaining an unjust status quo. You look at the Herero community. You look at the Aborigines. So the question continues, and if Jesus is God and it is not possible to attain salvation or indeed become fully human except through acknowledging his lordship, then any and all means are justified to obtain that salvation for the less fortunate occupants of this particular globe. Moreover, if you have attained salvation by being in Christ, then you are naturally a member of the privileged class. You have already carved out a piece of the paradise for yourself. And what has that led? That particular claim has led to the countless persecutions of indigenous people, of Jews, Africans, American Indians, and other non-Christian people. And, and if I may also add on that point, is that, again coming back to the whole issue of um, not being a label, if you ask the anthropologist and you go back and you look at the beliefs of people, what did people believe before someone came and told them what to believe? If you look at the documented studies of people like the Kapalka tribes of Papua who never met civilized man till the 1920s, if you look at the beliefs of people like the Aborigines, if you look at the beliefs of people like the Dinka community and so on, if you look at the beliefs of what did people believe before someone came and told them what to believe, you will find it is Islam in everything but name. They don't speak Arabic, they don't say Islam, the religion is one. God is one, he does not have sons. He does not get children, there is not a multiplicity of gods, and so on and so forth. So from that perspective you find the faith itself is all inclusive. It's not, it's not an exclusive faith. In fact, the address again and again is to humanity at large. In chapter 49 verse 13 you read the expression, O mankind, Ya Ayyuhan Nas, not O Muslims, you chosen people, or Muslims you chosen, or Christians or Jews. It says, O mankind, O humanity. We created you from a single pair and made you into nations and tribes that you may recognize each other, not that you may despise each other. He says, most certainly, the best of you in the sight of God is he who is most righteous in conduct. Not the fact that you view yourself as a chosen particular tribe or race or someone who's selected or someone who's basically received special types of salvation from God Almighty. Understand times at a particular premium. How much minutes do, do I have left? Do I finish up? Um, you know, unfortunately topics of this nature are inexhaustible and I basically just said less than half of what I proposed to in fact say, but I'd like to end on this particular note. When Jesus was about to leave this world, in John's Gospel again, he tells his disciples, yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, God had given Jesus the guidance to guide mankind till doomsday. But the people of his community, the superstitious and credulous people of his time, they were not prepared to receive the message. So he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When He, the Spirit of Truth, shall come, 
he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things ever shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. In the entire context of the Old and the New Testament, you will not find a single verse where you have seven he's masculine pronouns. In the first epistle of John chapter 4, when in amplifying this, we read the expression, Beloved, believeth not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of truth, or the prophet of truth. Every spirit, meaning every prophet, that confesses that Jesus is the Christ, is of God. And Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes them an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. In Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, just to prove that Jesus was not a mythical figure, he quotes extensively from the Talmud and the Mithna, where the malicious insinuation is made that Jesus' mother, Mary, was raped by a Roman soldier called Pandera, and God forbid, Jesus was begotten in this particular sense. So Jesus is described as Jesus ben Pandera, Jesus the son of Pandera, raped by a Roman soldier. You find a repudiation of such calumnies in the Quran itself, which rebuts the false allegations in terms and, and testifies to the actual uh, particular context in terms of which the word states. And I, I, I just, and I, I understand, I'm just ending with this one verse, I don't want to stretch it any further, but just a message to us as Muslims, and I'll end with this quotation. If we are to truly honor and respect the person of Jesus and live out the implications of his life and teachings, we can no longer make claims about the absolute uniqueness of Jesus or the necessity of the encounter with the person of Jesus for human liberation and salvation. To be true to the person of Jesus, his life of love and concern for other persons, his openness to persons of both sexes, of all economic classes, all cultural backgrounds, we must repudiate a Christology that measures the worth of persons based solely, solely on their personal relationship with Christ. I'd like to thank all of you for this um, opportunity in addressing you on a few words and may God bless us all. Thank you very much. Just for the record, the first gay that was used, that's me, the one that's gay and rejoice. And that rejoices on the second one. For people belonging to both the faiths, I urge and will appreciate it if questions are posed. They must be sharp, concise, and to the point. You talked about the, um, you know, the, the, the Masoretic text, 900 AD and that. Um, archaeologists picked up the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay, which are earlier than, than 600 AD when, when Muhammad was here. So my question in essence is the Dead Sea Scrolls, you mentioned for instance the, the text of John as being by another author and, and later on as, it's, as if John did not write it. Now in the Dead Sea Scrolls there is uh, Rylan's papyrus, a manuscript fragment dated at about AD 125, um, which contains a few lines, uh, lines from John. Obviously these scrolls have been damaged so we've lost some of the, you know, the text. But in essence, what these scrolls do is they authenticize the scriptures of and the canon of the Bible. So, how would you approach a subject like that? In many respects, they also prove something to the contrary. Um, over and above the Dead Sea Scrolls, if I may also draw this to your attention, uh, if you look at the year uh, which was discovered by a biblical scholar called Constantine van Tischendorf, have you heard of him? He basically discovered on the 5th of February 1859, and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls were subsequently found in the 40s, but he found leaves of an ancient codex uh, discovered at St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai, and they called that the Codex Sinaiticus. Now, some of the contents of this particular codex, which are described as oldest over and above the Dead Sea Scrolls, caused shockwaves in the Christian world. The reason for that is that in these particular manuscripts, for example, even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Gospels of Mark chapter 16 verse 9 to 20, 
dealing with the ascension of Jesus. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 51, dealing with the ascension of Jesus. I'm not there. You find further on, for example, um, words, for example, which describe Jesus as the Son of God, do not appear in the opening narratives in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, as they do appear in today's particular edition. And the modern day family tree tracing a particular messianic bloodline back to King David is non existent in these ancient particular biblical manuscripts. <coughs> um, the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, for example, which, where you read the expression, For there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, which is found in the vernacular of every single Bible biblical translation today in these ancient manuscripts that verse is not there. The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Alexandrinus simply seek to confirm this. So yes, whilst I agree that certain passages might be confirmed, at the same time you find instances where, for example, the Ascension, which is a fundamental part of faith, is not to be found in the ancient manuscripts. The writers of the Revised Standard Version, for example, particularly the 1952 edition, remove those particular passages and reduce it to a specific footnote. So I understand and I accept the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, a large portion of the Dead Sea Scrolls is still to be released to the public. There are many portions which are basically untranslated and unclear. And unless we have a complete set, um, you do understand that there's, there's a Dead Sea Scrolls Bible and there's a Dead Sea Scrolls which also contains non-biblical literature itself. So the fact that this non-biblical literature exists does not necessarily mean that this non-biblical literature is by all means authentic or should now be included as being part and parcel of the canon. You understand sure. the point? If, if I can just clarify my question, though, in essence, what I'm saying is I understand we've got Gnostic Gospels. Yes, yes, yes. I understand we've got other Gospels. Yes. But in terms of the canon of Scripture, what, what we are told and we, what we are being informed here is that in essence, uh, for instance, your argument about John, what I'm trying to say is, in essence, that if the Dead Sea Scrolls exist, and those texts, in essence, are older okay, than the Masoretic text, what I'm saying is that they then authenticate the accuracy of how the Bible has actually been translated down the years. You know, if you understand what I'm saying, so I'm, I'm not going to go into arguments on... It's, it's the same as, you know, as, as Bobby mentioned in the sermon now, we've got those notes in our Bibles. Mm. We know, for instance, we've got the Nestle on the Arlen text, we've got the Textus Receptus or the Masoretic text. But in essence, the central message of Scripture is not changed. Mm -hmm. The central message of Christ is not changed. And therefore, it has been accurately tra you know, transposed down the years. And in essence, we have lost none of the truth. Prior to the manuscripts of the Masoretic text, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, what you might have are certain fragments. In the, in the Christian world, there is a boast in the manner of speaking that there are 40,000 or 40,000 different manuscripts. But scholars today tell us, and you look at the writings, for example, interestingly enough, I hope I've brought this specific book. If you can avail yourself of a copy called by Richard Eliot Friedman. He's a professor on the faculty of the University of California, San Diego. He uh, published this particular book, Who Wrote the Bible? And he points out that there is a fundamental lack of consistency. For example, um, at yesterday's program, um, we were discussing the concept of the documentary hypothesis. I don't know if you were there, yes, President, on the particular the program. Text. And then what, what we've identified based on the um, scholarship of modern biblical higher criticism, particularly the works of Julius Wellhausen, and of course you had people like Jean Ostruck and um, uh, Tischendorf and um, you know, even Baruch Spinoza who were raising questions pertaining to the authorship of the Pentateuch. What biblical scholars, and this is a conventional, it's an accepted view amongst modern Christian scholars, not, not amongst evangelicals or amongst, um, amongst the Baptists, but amongst mainstream Christian scholarship that today in the Old Testament, for example, in the Pentateuch, you can identify strictly four, a pattern of four different writers writing in the context. Now, I understand, so you're shaking your head, but if you looked at the exercise we performed yesterday, what these biblical scholars did was that they saw in certain passages of the Bible, you had the word Lord God appearing. In Hebrew meaning, Yahuwah Elohim. Then, then, then you had passages where the word Elohim appeared, simply God. And then you had passages where the word the Lord our God appears. What these scholars did was that they experimented. They isolated the verses where the word God simply appears. 
they isolated the word verses where the words Lord God appears, and they isolated other verses, and they found a distinct continuous pattern showing a particularly different issue. For example, the two creations, and that's why you find that's why you find today you have two different accounts of the creation in Genesis chapter one and in Genesis chapter two. Okay, thank you. I would just like to know: Is it not true that none of the documents of the Dead Sea Scroll, biblical documents or non-biblical documents, since 1947 up to today, there was the new international version that came out in between, but none of them has used actual verses from the Dead Sea Scroll and included in their new translation. So if they have not included the actual documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls, then you can chuck the Dead Sea Scrolls away because it really is nothing. Okay. Can I just respond to that? Yeah. No, thank you very much for that. Um, what the beauty of the Dead Sea Scrolls is it confirmed what was already in our scriptures. So it wasn't used, our scriptures were already in place. That the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered is a great confirmation. Can I just say to this, yeah. since 1947 in the early uh, publications of the Dead Sea Scrolls, no one referred to the Christian theories in the Dead Sea Scrolls until they had murdered John Allegro. After murdering John Allegro, who was one of the researchers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, only then the picture changed and he argued that the teacher of righteousness is nothing to do with Jesus, that caused his death. I appreciate your scholarship. And thank you, a scholar. Well, <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> thank you for your, your learning. <laughs> I only have one question. Will you go to heaven? And if so, how do you know? Um, in respect of that particular issue about will you go to heaven, the Quran puts forth a question pertaining to people who claim that they have salvation already. It says as if, do they say that they then have a contract with God? In other words, your salvation happened at this particular point in time, never mind you lived for 40, 50 or even 60 years thereafter. Because we believe in Islam that you struggle till the day you die. Any given day, what's your view on it? Do you believe you've got your salvation particularly at this specific stage? But the point is that that in itself, the Quranic view on salvation is that you do two things. For those who believe and do righteous deeds, as James says, faith without action dead, they shall have eternal life. So in other words, as Jesus says, be ye perfect, even as the heavenly Father is perfect. We know that you cannot be perfect in the absolute sense. But if you make the attempt to be perfect, what we describe as relative perfection, you continue, you persist, you fall down, you struggle, and you try again, God will guide you. That is the view of salvation in this moment. And I think it's encapsulated quite clearly, if I may just end on this, in Ezekiel chapter 18, where you read the expression, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It doesn't stop there. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is Islam. You pay for your sins, I pay for my sins. As uh, in, in Ecclesiastes, further by these, my sons, um, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is weariness of the flesh. Let us come to the end of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments and you will enter the kingdom of heaven. First of all, I see that the, the biggest difference between our two faiths is the word that starts with T, the, the Trinity. If you could show me in the New Testament the actual word Trinity, I, I know that there are other words, but is there the word Trinity as should be the belief of existence? In the, uh, in the New Testament, or not the reference to something I am, uh, or I think that's I, okay. <laughs> just just the word. Thank you very much. The word Trinity is not found in the New Testament. The word Trinity is not found in the New Testament. The word Trinity is not found in the New Testament.
the teaching is. The word trinity is a convenient putting together of two English words, tri meaning three, and unit, unas, meaning one. And I think of the scripture in Matthew 28, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we believe in one God, revealed as both Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Difficult to understand, but we're talking about God. Clearly, beyond our conception, but this is how He has revealed Himself. Thank you for your question, Mark. Thank you for that. You, you talk very quickly, but you, you spoke about the begotten of God, Christ, and you likened it to animals that are the same. But surely the meaning of the word beget means of the same kind, because that's how it's used consistently. So therefore God got his own kind in Jesus. You state at the outset that God has his own specific kind in the context of Jesus, but then again you have to accept when you read the expression in Psalms chapter 2 verse 7, uh, where you read, the Lord had said unto David, the Lord had said unto me, that thou art my son, this specific day have I begotten thee. <coughs> so, in what context do we explain the term begotten? Um, For a Christian it's not a problem, because we're Trinitarian. We, we don't have a problem yeah. in that as well, but I mean, on, on that specific point, for example, what um, the issue of the Trinity, you know, which uh, Muhammad uh, raised and, and passed above, of course, if you accept that particular context, 1 John chapter 5 verse 7 is not there, but as um, the brothers quoted in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, Go ye therefore and uh, uh, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Right? Now, the problem is with this, if for example, um, the Great Commission, as narrated in the Gospel of Mark, bears no mention.